So now let's talk about lenses, shots, and angles. So wide angle lenses have the effect of widening the perspective from a given angle and a certain distance from the subject. This is an example of a 0.7 wide angle that increases the viewing angle by 30%. So this is not actually a lens, this is a converter. So it converts the existing lens that's attached to the camera and makes it 30% wider. It's called a 0.7x. Here's what it actually does. This is the actual frame with the, with the Century VS07 on the frame right now. Here's what happens when we take it off. You see how it's more pushed in and there's the actual lens, that's the converter, and it's made by Century Optics, 0.7. We're going to rewind right now and actually show me putting it back on so you can see exactly what it looks like when you put it back on into a scene like this. There we go. That's the 0.7x in action. That's what you're getting from the exact same perspective live, no cuts. Telephoto lenses have the effect of narrowing the perspective from a given angle and a certain distance from the subject. Here's a 1.6x telephoto converter that increases magnification by 60%. So when you put a 1.6x telephoto converter, you're getting pushed in 60% uh, closer to the, to the subjects. You're magnifying that area of the frame 60%. But even the best telephoto converters vignette towards the corners of the frame until you zoom in to compensate. These converters are designed to give you a greater magnification, not a full zoom scale. What, is it, what that means is that when you put it on the lens, the first thing you're going to see is it vignettes around the top left, right, and bottom left and right um, edges of the frame until you zoom in. And when you zoom in, that vignetting goes away. It's supposed to give you a good close-up, but you're not supposed to be able to use the entire zoom scale like with the 0.7x wide angle. So here's the, uh, the Century Optics, and we're putting it on right there, and you notice how it's vignetting. You can actually see the barrel, the entire barrel of the frame, until you actually zoom in. And here we go, we're adjusting the camera, we're zooming in a little bit more right there. And as soon as we zoom in far enough, you won't, you won't see that vignetting anymore. And we're going to rewind, zoom out just a little bit, tilt down, zoom out all the way, and we're going to remove it and see what kind of an effect it has. So you're getting closer to the actor 60%. This is the thing that allows you to get extreme close-ups and still have them in focus. Now we're going to talk about shots. A wide shot conventionally establishes the location and the action where the scene is about to take place. The framing depends on the scene. What matters is the proportions of the shots to each other within the frame. So essentially the wide shot, there's no convention for a wide shot. It's just in relation to the medium shot that you're going to take of that same scene. So when I tell my DP, I say, okay, give me a wide shot of the scene. Let's just say this is the wide shot. The medium shot is just going to be a little bit closer. But the wide shot could have been from much further away. As long as you just establish with your DP what a wide shot is, then he'll know what, the med what you mean by a medium shot and a close-up at that point. So this is what we established as a wide shot. A medium shot brings the audience closer to the action. It's not as personal as the close-up. It is better for editing to move in with the camera rather than zoom in. When you change shots, change the height, angle, and framing. What does that mean? Well, first of all, it's more personal in a close-up because you can see the actors better. You can see the action better. Um, it is better for editing to move in with the camera. When you want to go to a medium shot, don't just zoom in. Actually pick up the camera and move in closer to get that medium shot. And when you move in, always change the height, angle, and framing. This masks small differences in subject positioning and blocking. Uh, when you actually pick up the camera and move it in and change perspectives entirely, you won't actually see somebody's arm out of place in a different place or somebody looking in a different direction um, as with the wide shot because it's not a hard cut anymore. It's not a jump cut anymore. So this is a medium shot from a wide shot perspective. We're going to go ahead and zoom in and show you why it's better to actually move in with the camera rather than zoom in. This is just one where we zoomed in and we got a medium shot. This is the position now for actually moving in. So we moved in, we got a new perspective. This is a whole different perspective. And now we're going to cut back and forth and show you the differences between the two shots. This is a wide, this is the original establishing wide shot. I want you to concentrate on that for just a little bit and just kind of see. This is a freeze frame. So I want you to see exactly where everybody is. This is a medium shot from that position. It feels like it's a hard cut, like it's a you know just a jump cut, like something happened in the action. Um, the actors just kind of jumped out at you. There's the wide shot again. It just feels like the action just doesn't look right. Now let's see what happens when we actually just pick up the camera and move in closer with it. Right there. When we actually moved in closer with the camera, 
it just it just feels like a whole different perspective. It doesn't feel like the actors just pop out of the frame closer to you. Moving in even further with a wide-angle lens is even more personal, and it changes the relative proportions of the actors. The actor closest to the wide-angle lens appears larger. So that means that when you actually move in even closer with a wide-angle lens, you're going to get even closer feeling to these actors. Um, you're going to feel like you're right next to them rather than a medium shot with a telephoto lens. And also it's going to enlarge the actor that who's closest to the lens. Whoever's closest to the camera is going to feel bigger than the person that's right behind them. So here we go. We moved in even closer. You can see the original position right there. And we moved in about, I think, about six or seven feet. And there's our new position for the tripod. And we're using the wide angle lens now. Well, we're using the furthest, widest point of our lens. So this is a medium shot using a wide angle lens. This is not the converter, this is just a wide angle lens. So we just zoomed out all the way and using our wide angle portion of our zoom lens. And there's the old medium shot. You can even use your DVD player to go back and forth and see the difference, but it's a major difference. I mean, the, the, the wide angle shot just feels so much more personal. There's that other medium shot that we took from the new perspective. And now we're going to cut directly from this back to the wide angle shot. Watch this in just a moment. Look at the background. Watch the background. There it is. You see that? It just feels like you're you really just kind of like right there next to the performance. It feels a lot more personal. And now we're going to maintain a consistent focal length when moving in from shot to shot because it helps the audience feel that they have simply moved closer to the action rather than magnified a certain area of the frame. So rather than zooming in from a far away distance and just magnifying that area of the frame, when you pick up the camera and actually move closer to the subjects, it makes the audience feel like they actually walked closer to the, the performers. It's a much more organic type of frame. It feels like you just really did get closer to the actors. So here's the wide shot. We're going to concentrate on that for a little bit. And there's the medium shot using the wide angle lens. It actually feels like the camera got closer to the actors, like we kind of abbreviated a dolly shot and ended up at the actors. Now here's the wide shot again. And what we're going to do is we're going to cut to the medium shot of just a zoom, zoomed in shot. And watch what happens. It feels like the actors are going to pop right in front of you. You see that? They just pop right in front of you. It doesn't feel natural. It feels like you just kind of like use a set of binoculars from that uh, far away distance rather than moving closer to them. Now a CMS or a close medium shot is closer than a medium shot but not quite as close as a close up. Um, this is a textbook. This is a real shot. It's called a close medium shot. This is just a way for you to communicate with your DP. That way when you tell them, well, I don't want a medium shot. Uh, I don't want a close up. I want something right in the middle. You don't have to keep saying that every single time. You can just say I want a CMS or I want a close medium shot. You'll notice that we're a little bit closer to them than from the medium shot, but not quite as close as a close up. So it's a little bit more personal. You can see the actors a little bit more, uh, but at the same time, you're not just isolating one actor or doing an over the shoulder. So this is a medium shot using the wide angle lens. And now we're going to cut from this to the CMS here in just a second. Notice how you can see all the way down to their knees, essentially, and above their heads. This is a CMS. You've cut them off pretty much right above the elbow, but you still have the headroom right above their heads. But you're not cutting them off like right below the shoulder for, as for a close-up. The same principles apply when moving in for a close-up. Change height, angle, and framing to accommodate the subject. However, try not to get a close-up on an actor with a wide-angle lens, since that will be unflattering unless you're doing it for effect. Which means that when you actually get closer to an actor and try to do a close-up with a wide-angle lens, you're going to distort their features. They're not going to look right. Um, they're going to look like they have a huge nose, or they're going to also look like they're a lot larger than the, uh, than the actor right behind them. We're going to actually do that in a second. We're going to see how moving in with a wide-angle lens exaggerates her size in proportion to his. But, I mean, to, like, not, at, not even a normal degree. So here we go. This is a close-up with a wide-angle lens. Notice how she looks almost like she's twice as big as he is. If you're going for effect, which means you're trying to create an environment where things feel like they're out of the ordinary or out of place, or you're trying to get inside an actor's mind, then you, would, you might explore doing something like that. But normally, when you do a close-up, you want to do it with a telephoto lens so that you can be more kind to their features and compress the perspective a little bit more. Now, remember what you're seeing here is still a two-shot but it has close-up framing. So it's framed like a close-up, which means it's head and shoulders, but it's still a two-shot. You have both actors in the frame.
And by all means, close-ups don't have to be just head and shoulders. They can be even closer than that. Just depends on the proportion of the medium shot. We'll also go over extreme close-ups later on in the series. They're extremely tightly framed close-up shots, usually showing only a very specific action. Let's just say somebody's eyebrows or somebody's eye or nose. Just one part of their face sometimes. Depth of field is controlled by iris, focal length, distance from camera to subjects, and distance from subjects to background. So the more you close down your iris, let's say you go to an F8 or an F11, uh, the more you're going to see into the background, the more the background is going to be in focus. The more you open it up, the less you're going to see the background, the more it's going to be out of focus. We're going to give you an example of that coming up. We're also going to give you examples of all the stuff coming up in the series too. Um, the more you increase the distance from camera to subject, the more you're able to throw the background that's directly behind that subject out of focus. The more you increase the distance from the subject to the background, the more you can decrease depth of field, which means that the background right behind the subject will be a lot more in focus than a background that's 50 feet away from the subject. So also what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the fact that most people are trying to achieve a shallow depth of field. Usually when you're trying to shoot, you're trying to get that background out of focus. So that's achieved by using a long focal length telephoto lens, an open iris, greater distance from subject to background, and appropriate distance from camera to subject. And that last one is very much dependent on the situation that you're in and the type of telephoto lens that you're using and the camera that you're using. So that depends on the situation. But the other three always apply. Longer focal length, more wide open iris, and greater distance from subject to background are always going to give you a background that is more out of focus. So we're going to discuss an example of that. Here's an example. We're using a telephoto lens. We're about six feet from the actors. The actors are about 50 feet or more from the background, and we'll be using neutral density filters to open up the iris of the camera and reduce depth of field, and then reverse it. Neutral density filters, all they do, there are two that are built into the camera, and they're dark gray filters that are behind the lens. They step in and they darken the frame. They reduce the amount of light that's coming through the lens and hitting the CCD, which is the actual imager of the camera. So they allow you to shoot with a wide open aperture. There's the DP right now engaging the first ND filter. Then he's going ahead and irising up. Then he's going to the higher filter, that's ND uh, filter number two, and he's opening up the iris even further. So let's go ahead and watch the background. See how it's all in focus. You can actually see that tree back there and it's totally in focus. Now here's the DP going to ND filter number one. You notice how it darkens the frame. Then he compensates with the iris and it throws that background a little bit out of focus, but not really enough because we're not quite at a wide open iris yet. We have a long focal length and there's a great distance from the subjects to the background, but we don't have a wide open aperture yet, a wide open iris. So we're gonna go ahead and switch up to filter number two. This is ND filter number two, which is absorbing two stops of light, again, just like the first filter. And there you go, you'll notice that that background has gone completely out of focus because we've satisfied the three requirements for achieving a shallow depth of field. We have a long focal length or telephoto, we have a wide open iris, and there's a great distance from the subjects to the background. So now we're going to go backwards. We're going to start with a shallow depth of field, which is what you see in front of you, and we're going to show the DP going step by step. He's reducing down to ND1, and he's reducing the iris, reducing the exposure of the camera. There it goes right there. Then he's going to go to no ND. This is ND off, and He's again going to go ahead and close down the iris even more, reduce the exposure in the camera, and there comes the background in focus. Now panning is turning the camera left and right. A pan can illustrate a setting, track a subject, or reveal new information. We've already seen some pans in the last uh, section that we just did. We were uh, panning with the subject as they were traveling from left to right or right to left. So you can illustrate a setting in a wide panning shot and show the entire area. Or you can pan on a close-up and just concentrate on tracking a subject rather than illustrating a setting. Or you can pan not with a subject and not in a wide shot, but just pan over to something interesting in the frame to reveal new information. This can be something that the audience is not yet aware of that you just want to pan and illustrate without actually cutting to another whole shot. So in conjunction with subject movement, it can establish location and further the story. Panning with the subject movement reduces eye strain. Now what that means is whenever you have movement in the shot, whenever a person is actually moving in the shot and you're panning with them, it's always going to be easier on the eye than when you're just doing a pan and there's nothing moving in the shot. 
watch this shot and watch how because the performers are there we're able to pan at probably a greater speed than we would normally be able to pan because there's something for the audience to see and watch when we pan the other side that was a right to left pan this is a left to right pan tracking with the performers with movement and whenever there isn't movement in the frame we do have to pan a little bit slower otherwise it's going to create eye strain in the audience you can also pan with a closer shot and get a tracking shot where you track the actors closely as they move through the frame. We can pan a lot faster when we're zoomed in and we're tracking movement. Watch how fast we can pan in this particular shot because of the speed of the actual actors because the audience is concentrating only on them so it doesn't matter how fast the background is going but that background is moving really fast. In a static shot the camera does not move. It forces the audience to only concentrate on the location and the actors blocking and that's it. There's no motion, no tilting, no panning. This is a static shot. It's just a lockdown tripod shot. It forces the audience to only look at the location, the framing, and the actors blocking, and that's it. Here's the same shot with a pan motion, just so you can see kind of a little bit of the difference. So we're starting with a pan, and eventually we settle into the static shot framing right there. Uh, tilts are a great way to reveal new information to the audience without widening the frame. They are also essential for revealing clothing that identifies a character. So let's just say you don't want to go to a wide shot, but you want to reveal clothing very slowly to the audience in a close-up form, that's when you tilt up. So we're slowly tilting up on the actress, revealing the character's clothing that identifies that particular character and her persona in the, in the actual movie. We're tilting up, we're maintaining a close-up, we're not losing the audience's attention by going to a wide shot. The height of the camera always influences perception. How far you put the camera? You put it at the eye level of the performers when they're walking? Do you put it at their waist level? Do you put it at their, at their knee level? So we're going to look at three different examples of the exact same motion. Camera at eye level, camera at waist level, then camera at knee level. And we're going to see how it affects our perception of the frame. So here it is at eye level, eye level to the performers. And now we're going to watch it again at waist level. And we're going to use a lot more of these examples later on in the series. This is at waist level. And now we're going to do it at about knee level. Watch how the performers appear to kind of be more like larger than life when we're at knee level. It just feels like we're looking up at them like, you know, it's there's a lot more grandeur kind of attached to the scene. Like um, this is a great occasion. This is a happy occasion. Or the performers are actually larger than life. The always the height of the camera always influences the audience's perception. Uh, when you make an, a, a subject larger appear larger in the frame, you're always assigning more grandeur to it. You're assigning you know more godlike qualities to it. Whenever you go up higher and you look down on a performer, you're always going to assign other kinds of emotions to it. You're going to make that person look smaller, like they're smaller in the frame, smaller in life. And you can use that as well to your dramatic advantage, too, when you're telling a story, depending on where the character is in that part of their lives. Most of the time, you want to use the dolly in conjunction with action that's actually happening in the frame creatively. So you would only use the dolly when something happens in the script. Let's just say... Uh, they say a specific line and some kind of a dramatic moment is about to happen, you would use a dolly shot to come closer with the camera and emphasize that particular line of the script or that particular dramatic moment. So let's just say in this point, um, he's telling her that he's going to break up with her and she's going to pick up the knife like she's going to stab him with it or something, but just kind of start twirling it right there in the foreground. So you want to dolly in on just that moment to only emphasize that particular dramatic moment as opposed to just dollying the entire shot just to add production value. This is dollying on a dramatic moment. So here we go. Um, he's telling her he's going to break up with her. He's saying he's just about had it. And so she picks up the knife. We start to dolly. We get him out of the frame and then back in. And then we tilt down to the knife. So this was a dolly in combination with a tilt down on a dramatic moment. So this is going to be a zoom shot on a dramatic moment with a tilt to reveal the knife. Zooms, of course, are not as natural as dollies because we're just magnifying a certain part of the frame rather than moving closer with the camera. We'll go over this a lot more in the series. There's just a zoom shot. You can see how it's unnatural. It just magnifies a certain part of the frame rather than comes closer to the actress. It's very soap opera kind of type of movement. 
Now we're trying to get a close up from the master shot perspective and not allowing for face room or look space. So when you try to get a close up from the master shot position, which we'll go over much more later, but you don't give the actor face room, which is look space, it's not going to look good. You got to give him some face room, which is room for the actor's face to kind of look away at the other actor on the other side of the frame. And if you don't do that, it feels like the actor's face is way too close to the edge of the frame in the wrong way. Whenever you cheat in an actor, you ask him to move in or out of the frame unnaturally. This is not where the actor would normally be. He's far away from her. It's farther away from when he was before, but we're cheating him in because it looks good for the camera. So he's actually much further away than he was before, but it looks really good for the camera for the actual action shot. What we just showed you before is a close-up over the shoulder shot. This is the wider version of that exact same shot, just a little bit wider. You'll notice it's not as personal. It's wider, you can see more, but it feels more illustrative than cinematic. Here's poor framing on this close-up where you have too much headroom. This is too much headroom. You've already seen what it's supposed to look like. This is too much headroom. You'll notice that there's just a lot of open space above his head. It just doesn't look right. It doesn't feel right. We need to tilt down the camera and move in a little bit and adjust the frame a little bit. So this, this is not the right way to do it. This is too much headroom. So this is poor framing on his close-up. There's no face room or headroom. We already talked about um, this before that you can't put the face too close to the edge of the frame. Here it is again, just to show you one, one more time how you're not supposed to frame a close-up. There's no headroom. There's no room above his head. There's no face room. He's looking right into the edge of the frame. It's not a very nicely framed image you're not supposed to cross the eye line to get his close-up just like you didn't cross the eye line to get her close-up. Even though the lighting is going to probably look a little bit nicer at first, but it won't cut in post. Um, when you try to cut it with a master shot, they're going to switch positions. He used to be on the left side, now he's on the right side. He used to be on the left side, now he's on the right side. And it will it will not cut with the actual master shot where you establish them as him being on the right side. And now he just popped on off to the left side. It just won't cut. We'll illustrate that a lot more later on, how it just will not cut, and how to maintain the proper eye line for all your actors. Crossing the eye line to get her close up will not cut with the master shot. Check this out. When you cross over to the other side of his shoulder instead of the first side, even though the lighting looks better, but it will not cut with the master shot. Flipping the actor's positions will cross the line of sight and the lighting direction. You have to move the camera to the other side. You can't just have them flip their seats and go, oh, okay, I can just shoot the shot. It's, it'll, it'll work just fine. You can't do that. The lighting will change, the direction of the light will change. It used to come from her left side, now it's going to come from her right side. And also their, their positions are all changed up, so you just can't do it. You have to actually change the camera position. That's the only way you can get um, where you're not crossing the line of sight and the lighting direction. Now we're going to talk about axes of movement. This is the axes of movement of performers in the frame, or their faces, or their bodies actually moving in the frame. First one is a z-axis. That's motion to and from the camera. The subject gets larger and smaller in the frame. In a two-dimensional world, which is the world of the camera, it doesn't really perceive that objects are actually traveling closer and further away from the camera. It just perceives them as actually getting bigger and smaller. And the only way you can increase that feeling of actual distance is by introducing side light, where you side light something so that it feels like it's actually traveling away from you. And also by using the memory, human memory, where we know when somebody's actually walking away from the camera just by the motion of their legs, it means they're actually increasing the distance between them and the camera, as you can see here in the frame in front of you. But if it weren't for our memory effect, and if it weren't for the side lighting, we wouldn't really perceive these people actually walking away from the camera. They would just appear to be getting smaller and smaller in the frame. Now, subjects traveling towards the camera are more engaging than one traveling away from the camera because the action is literally coming to you. It's coming to the camera. So here they are again. It's the same shot. You can see their faces. You can see the action. You can see their performance. It's just a much more interesting shot than the one where they were just walking away. When you bring the action to the camera, it's always going to be more interesting than when you make it go away from the camera, unless you're doing it for effect, where you're trying to make these performers shrink into the distance for psychological effect or dramatic effect. Now, when you're using a wide-angle lens, the subject moves very quickly near the camera and then disappears slowly. So we're going to watch this shot here coming up of our actor, and he's going to be walking near the camera real fast. But as soon as he gets away from the camera, it feels like it takes him forever then to traverse any kind of distance. Let's watch him coming back down the mountain here. He comes in. It feels like it takes forever until he gets close to the camera, and then he moves really fast. Let's watch that one more time. And remember, the telephoto lenses do the exact opposite. 
When using a telephoto lens, the subject moves very slowly the entire time since the distance to the camera is not being exaggerated. This means that the camera is so far away from the subject that the distance that the subject is traveling is actually negligible compared to the distance that the camera is far away from the subject. So being far away from a performer moving towards you, as we are in this case, is going to make it look like they're just taking forever to get to you. They're very, very slowly coming closer and closer and closer. And the distance that they're traveling is nowhere near as far as how far away we are from them. In the x-axis, the subject travels left and right in the frame, left and right. So we're going to see some examples of that and the psychological impact of that too. Here they are. They're traveling from right to left. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. The direction of travel in the frame from left to right is extremely important. The reason being is that travel towards frame right is always easier on the eye because it moves with the direction of reading text left to right. So you can use that to dramatic advantage when you're telling a story visually with the camera. Um, if someone's headed towards something that they don't want to go and do, you can make them go right to left. And it's going to make, subliminally, it's going to make the audience feel like there's something uncomfortable about this motion. However, if they're going someplace where they want to be going or if it's like a happy occasion, you can move them from left to right because naturally that's what the audience is going to feel like is the natural progression from left to right along with the reading eye. The y-axis, the subject travels up and down in the frame, up and down in the frame. So we already talked about the z-axis, forward and back, x-axis, left and right. This is the y-axis, up and down. The y-axis, when the subject is traveling downwards in the frame, it's always easier on the eye because it's the direction of gravity. So any object or subject that's traveling downwards in the frame is always going to feel like it's easier on the eye because they're going with the direction of gravity. They're coming downhill with gravity. Any subject that's traveling up in the frame appears to be fighting gravity. And it doesn't matter if it's a human being walking uphill or a car going uphill. You can use it to psychological impact because our eyes perceive it as a difficult motion when something is going uphill or up in the frame. Usually from the bottom right to the top right or from the bottom right to the top left. Um, so any subject that's traveling diagonally to the left and up in the frame is the most difficult for the eye to follow. Why is that? Because it's against the reading eye and it's uphill. So, we're going to watch an example of that. This is the most difficult motion for the eye to follow, for an audience's eye to follow. When they see this, they perceive it as being an extremely difficult motion. They, they perceive it psychologically as being a bad thing. Y-axis. Subject traveling diagonally to the right and down in the frame is the easiest for the eye to follow. Why? It goes with the reading eye and downhill. So here we are. It's the exact same motion. Watch it again. It feels like it's easier in the eye. It feels like... This is something that is easy to follow, an easy action to follow. You can use that to your dramatic advantage. So now we're going to talk about composition. This is going to be probably one of the harder sections to understand at first because it kind of really takes you out of, um, out of the comfort element of what you've been used to. But we will go over composition a lot in this series. So the law of thirds is an age-old principle that prescribes placing the main subject of interest along the bottom or top third of the frame off to one side. It is not written in stone and it's broken all the time, but it is a good principle to learn when trying to create harmony in the frame. So we're going to go ahead and illustrate that. It means that when you break up the frame into thirds, like a tic-tac-toe kind of grid, and you've put the performer either to the left or to the right side and either to the top third or the bottom third, you're always going to have a more interesting frame than when they're just centered up. Um, that's what the law says. It doesn't always apply, but if you're trying to create harmony, it's nice to know that it's actually there for you. There's the grid of thirds. And you can see that we put our subject of interest, which is her. She's the one we're trying to create sympathy for. We put her up in the top right-hand third of the frame. Now, a rack focus changes the plane of focus along the z-axis, which means that it shifts the focus creatively to another plane behind the current one and thereby reveals new information to the audience. So we're going to go ahead and illustrate that. But what does that mean? It means that you have planes of movement, foreground, midground, background. And when you change the focus between those planes from foreground to midground, you're actually traveling with your focus along the z-axis, which travels far and close to the camera. So we're going to actually illustrate that right now. This is the current plane of focus in the foreground. Now there's a new story element about to happen. There she is in the background. So we rack focus to her, reveal the actor in the background and then we back to the foreground plane of focus. So we use the focusing mechanism to focus as a story element. Forms in the frame. There are many shapes that occur in nature, like lines, triangles, and rectangles, but there are also shapes that can be created by the blocking of actors. 
it leads the audience unconsciously down a certain emotional path. And this is because different shapes in nature mean different things to us. Triangles, you know, are like usually broad bases and they, they just symbolize kind of like power and strength for us. Um, rectangles are very balanced for us and so are squares too. Um, circles are, you know, kind of harmonious. The blocking either creates shapes in the frame or it pushes the audience's eye to look at certain points of interest. Those points then create invisible shapes in space due to the movement of the audience's eye. This is going to be probably the most difficult you know, new concept to process as it was for me 10 years ago. Um, watch what happens now. We're going to go ahead and illustrate a few things for you. And watch what happens. It's not just the motion of the people in the frame, but where you're actually looking as an audience, where your eyes are looking. You're drawing these lines. The audience first sees any actor's eyes in the frame. Then the next set of eyes. Then the widest object near the center. Lightness always advances. Darkness always recedes. Then the widest object off-center. This can all be trumped by motion. A moving object in the background easily upstages all the above. So the first thing you're going to see is the first actor's eyes. As human beings, that's the first thing we notice in the frame. Then we're going to go to the next set of eyes, then the other white object closest to the frame, then off frame. Also, more colorful or warm colored objects will trump cool colored objects. So someone wearing a red coat is always going to stick out more than someone wearing a dark blue coat. It's just the way it is. That's the way we process color. Um, that's the way our perception is in our eyes. And we're going to also see an example of that too. And actually later in the series we'll see a lot more examples of that. But we're going to watch the following scene and this is going to at least prime you so that when, when you see more of these examples later on in the future, you'll be ready for them. Okay, here we go. Now this is a tough concept, so open your mind. Here we have a rectangle in the frame. The blocking of these performers is making a rectangle shape in the frame. When the other performer comes in in the background, she moved in and she stole the attention away from that rectangle. So motion always trumps everything else. Now, her pink coat is going to take more attention away than from his blue one or the other actress's black coat. So color trumps other colors. Warm colors trump other cool colors. Now here's the next difficult concept. Watch how their body positions in the frame make a triangle. They make a triangle with their faces, the three objects of interest in the frame but they don't just make a triangle with the actual two-dimensional visual image that you see in front of you that's grouped like a triangle. They also make a triangle because the audience bounces from her face to his face to Laura's face behind him, back to her face, to his face, to Laura's face, and that creates the motion of a triangle, an invisible line in space that actually says something to the audience. It has an emotional impact on the audience. Now watch what happens when Laura, the actress in the back, moves closer. She creates a different type of new triangle. It's a more of a taller triangle where she completely dominates the frame. So this is a new triangle that we've created for the audience where she's completely dominating the frame. Now watch what happens when Tatiana, the actress on the left, actually gets up to move. The light actually hits her and she becomes more illuminated than any of the other actors in the frame. That draws attention to her due to lighting contrast. Then when she stands up, we have a new triangle where she's actually dominating the frame, primarily because she's the tallest one in the frame right now, and she's also the closest one to the camera. And her height and her closeness to the camera is going to dominate the frame. Also, she's isolated on the left side by herself, whereas Laura is grouped with the actor on the right side. So her isolation on the left side is going to always draw more attention to her because she's an isolated entity in the frame rather than clumped, rather than her in any other part of the frame. The last thing is that also she's getting more lighting than the rest of the actors. She has that rim light or the kicker light from the sun and that's another reason why we put her there is that she so that she can actually get the sun and that it draws even more attention to her than the other actors. Now watch how they're both looking at the actor seated on the bottom right hand side. Watch how the the movement your eye is going to go directly to them and then down to him. So the audience is going to keep shifting in this triangle trying to figure out if one of them is looking at the other one or if they're still looking at him. They keep going around in this triangular configuration. That's a motion of the audience's eyes back and forth back and forth. And now they both go off in different directions. We block them that way and as you remember going to the right side is with the reading eye, going to the left side is against the reading eye and that has emotional impact too and they leave the actor alone sitting in the middle of the frame making a very narrow base triangle with his body 
And also his isolation becomes his own strength again. By himself, he's again stronger. But at the same time, because he's so small in the frame and he has so much headroom and so much area and room around him, it creates more isolation for him in the frame and makes him seem smaller. Remember how he talked about the smaller object in the frame feels smaller to the person. This guy really kind of messed up in his life and he ended up cheating on one girl to go out with another. And therefore now he's all alone in the frame, a small object, a small narrow base triangle sitting in the frame. All these things matter. I know it's a hard pill to swallow, but every single one of these concepts is a real old principle that has been used and handed down from cinematographer to cinematographer for ages for trying to impart dramatic content or dramatic um, dramatic power to a frame not just based on the actor's dialogue and the storyline but to take something that's visual a visual medium which is that's what cinematography is and actually take that visual medium and create drama with the camera not just with the performers not just with the dialogue or with the action but actually with the camera help the story by creating drama with the camera whenever you compose a frame have that frame mean something. We're going to go through a lot more of these concepts in the series. You've got about 10 more hours of this. And by the time you come out of it in the other end, I think you're going to probably look at the world in a whole different place, kind of more like I do, you know, uh, where everything is kind of a series of lights and darks and shapes and rectangles and triangles and circles. And, you know, I think that it's going to really help you become a better camera operator or a better DP or a better cinematographer or a better director or a storyteller, or a writer, or an actor, whatever you intend to do in your life, I'm hoping and praying that this series will help you accomplish whatever you want to in life.